Hi, welcome back to Bio 131. We are in our first module beginning the semester and at this point we're in chapter 22 and um, you should have watched um, the first um, video lecture. I took the chapter and divided it into three. That first one was longer than these next two that we're going to be um, doing. And so in the first one we went over the scientific method and the nuts and bolts how um, evolution works, the, the, um, the steps in the process. Uh, I hope you have also had time to do the online simulation of evolution and play around with that to get a feel it rather, you know, kind of cartoonish, but to see how the features get selected and the population changes over time. Um, that particular um, uh, example will be giving you more microevolution, which I'll talk about. So today what I'm going to be going over in this um, lecture is we're going over evidence. And so uh, we have this hypothesis originally on how evolution came about. And when I talk about the history of evolution, Darwin wasn't the first one to propose a hypothesis on it. Um, but that version is the one that in the way we see it today was accepted. All right. And it's been modified since then, obviously. And um, so what is some of the evidence? Why do we, you know, for something to go from hypothesis to theory, you need um, concrete evidence that it's true. And so I'm going to go over the different lines of evidence that we have to support evolution. Okay, so some of the things I'll be going over, I'm going to go over biogeography and define that. We'll look at um, speciation and adaptation. In this case, we'll be looking at it as part of biogeography and talking about the finches from um, the origin of species on the Galapagos Islands. Then I'll talk about microevolution. Um, give you some uh, examples of that and some um, uh, experiments that they've actually run. And so we can see some data when they've actually tested in experiments. And then we have some observations, and that'd be microevolution. Fossil record, here's my little cartoon of Barney the dinosaur down there. Um, and then I'll talk about some um, features that we see from the fossil record that are present today. Um, these features changing, and we refer to these as homologous structures. And I'll contrast them with analogous structures, terms you may or may not already know. Talk a little bit of biochemical um, comparisons and um, just talk about morphology and um, embryology. So the first one I want to go over is biogeography. And so um, looking at that term, it uh, is made up of two parts, biology and geography. And so biogeography is looking at the distributions of species across the world, where you find them, and then relating that to the history, usually geologic time, how they got there, or their origins and specializations once they're there into different areas like the finches um, and the Galapagos, and that would be more ecological and speciation, right? And so here I have a map, sorry, my picture playing around Greencast, let me get out of there a little bit. Um, is showing you obviously those are the continents, but they're not where they are today. And this is hundreds of millions of years ago. We'll we'll talk more about this when we get to um, macro evolution in chapter 25. But it's showing you biogeography. All right. And so if you look in the different color bands that we have going across, we can actually see these distributions. And this gives some evidence of. Um, plate tectonics, but also once we have um, plate tectonics, it explains the distribution of the fossils because those land masses were touching back then, right? And that's how these things distributed across. And so by looking at the distribution of those fossils, that'll be something of biogeography, right? And so we can actually look at things today and see some examples of, of specialization that's happened and spread on local areas. So, for example, um, natively, uh, eucalyptus trees are only found in Australia, right? Um, we have some specialized pine and fir tree, right, um, that are up in North America, but you don't find them down in South America. You have different types of trees, right? In South America, you have succulent cacti bellining in the, and in North America, cacti, but the similar plants in terms of the morphology, you look at it and you didn't know any better, you'd say that's a cactus that has no leaves, it's all succulent, it's got spines, Right, but those are actually members of a different plant family in the euphorbia, right? And so we'll be talking a little bit about that with convergence. And so here's an example of biogeography. So these are all manatids, like a praying mantis, right? In the same um, uh, insect group order. 
And if we look at them, they're from Malaysia, South Africa, and Borneo. So two of them over in Indonesia area and one in South Africa. They look very different, but being all mantids, right, they have a common ancestor. And so looking at where we find the distribution of, of the animals, and then you can actually look at the ecological specialization that's taking place, some in a drier area versus others in a tropical rainforest. And you can see the changes that have happened to them. Okay, so this is a, a diagram of uh, what Darwin, and a lot of people know about Darwin's example from his book on the origin of species. And he didn't have this all figured out. What he did is he collected, move me, can't quite get me out of there. Um, you can see the sizes of the beaks. So you have these very big beaks getting larger seeds, small, finer beaks are for eating um, insects or finer seeds. All right, and so you can see these adaptations, and I don't see the parrot beak one on here, or the cross beak one there. Anyway, they also have one that'd be more like a parrot-like beak for eating the, the flesh off of cactus. And so you have a couple things with biogeography. First, that it's only finches in the Galapagos. Why not all the other species you find at that tropical zone elsewhere on the world? And then why do you have so many different specializations in the finches? Right, and so studying this, and this gives us evidence of one, that they have only have finches there because you have a single common ancestor that flew onto the island, probably in a storm, in a hurricane, got brought, um, brought over there, right, is one idea, right? And of course, it'd have to be a small population or, you know, not one individual's not going to do it. But they get established, and then as they colonize the different islands, their descendants specialize into all of these different types of birds, right? So that's biogeography. Flipping the coin, the other part of biogeography is why aren't there woodpeckers there or wobblers or other types of birds? And that's because they couldn't get there, right? They didn't have that event of, of uh, being blown over in a storm and arriving there and adapting, right? So both what is there, how it's specialized, what is not there, that is all related to biogeography and gives us some evidence of evolution. Right? And here's some pictures of these different, so these are all finches, right? And so um, if we saw a finch around here, it would look a little bit more like that. You can see there's much larger bills, right, adapting to different food sources, um, showing you that specialization that they have. Right? Another line of evidence that we have is microevolution. And so micro means small, and in this case it's actually referring to um, the small level of changes in the population. And so at the smallest level, we can record microevolution as a small change in genetic frequencies over time. All right, and if you remember to that example I give you in the lecture on how evolution works, I introduced you with um, that you had the experiment in Nebraska. They were relating the, the outward morphology, um, how many Darker morph versus lighter morph mice were surviving in this field relative to the soil. That would be microevolution. It's not new species. If we go back up here, these are all separate species, right? That's a speciation event. So one species becoming and deriving into several daughter species, right? Um, it's not quite macroevolution because these are still birds. It's not like dinosaurs turning into birds. That would be macroevolution. And I'll give you an example of that when we get to the whales later on. Right, but this is still all within one species. So the what I was talking about for the mice would just be on that diagram on a single line up here. It's not giving rise to other species. Right, so that would be microevolution. And if you remember in that example with the mice, not only did they have the morphology, but they actually went to the frequencies of the genes and that allele that accounted for it. All right. So microevolution, micro small evolutionary changes in populations. Right, not enough to be separate species. Some examples we'll talk about is we have antibiotic resistance. How these become resistant, we'll talk about um, when we get to prokaryotes and bacteria, all right? Um, right now, they just, they're just doing it, all right? And so here's gonorrhea, it's a bacterial sexually transmitted disease. And you can actually see that, um, you can see the rates, and so as it goes up, that means that that bacteria causing the disease are more resistant to um, these antibiotics. And you can see these trends of different ones. And you can notice here, when you have a very new antibiotic, the fluoroquinolone, fluoroquinolone, and then the newest one, cetimifi, right? Um, these come out, and you can see 0% resistance, 
they haven't been exposed to it. It's apparently, and it's not 100%, it's be close, over 99, are dying from it. But you can see over time, they build up resistance, right? All the things are building up, right? So that's the change. It's still gonorrhea. It's still causing the same disease. It's not a new species, right? But it's different. The population now has resistance to the antibiotics where it didn't before, right? Same thing with mosquitoes over here in DDT. We'll get to DDT, and you may have heard it, about it in um, environmental science um, at the end of the semester and, and uh, bioaccumulation. But it was made, and it's very strong, a mosquito side. And mosquitoes carry a lot of diseases, especially malaria. And in countries with a lot of malaria, they still use DDT. And it can show that when you're using DDT, initially there's very little resistance to it. But in, in one year, and you have to think for insects, that's several generations now, it can build up to being very, um, uh, very small amount of the population is now even being impacted by um, that um, mosquito side in this case. Again, they're still mosquitoes. They're not a new species, right? But they're changing over time. So this is showing you that that process, that some up here and even down here, some mosquitoes are resistant. They carry a natural mutation. They survive the influx of, of either the antibiotic into the population or the mosquito side into the population. They survive and reproduce. That percentage gets um, increased in the population. That's evolution, right? You can see the selection pressure involved. You can see the um, selective um, uh, reproductive success in terms of living to reproduce and surviving. Right? And then that changed the population over time. Small changes, microevolution, but it's still evolution. Right? Microevolution is the only one we can observe in our lifetime. It takes too long to build up enough mutations and accumulate them to become a new species in much, 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 much longer time to actually become new lineages or actually have significantly different changes into the um, morphology of an organism. Right? Um, for experiments, I won't talk too much about this one. This is one of the first experiments. It happened um, just a few years after Darwin published his book. And this is on the pepper moths in um, England. And there, it was, it was publishing in the 1860s during the Industrial Revolution. And what was happening is they increased the amount of coal being burned to power these um, uh, plants and manufacturing. And so the bark on the trees got covered in soot. And naturally, on the barks on the trees, there would be lichens. And they'll be lighter and darker um, parts. And so on the tree, right, here's the moth. The moths that land on the lichen that are light, right, would be the more uh, less apparent, right, more camouflaged. But the darker one would stand out. And then when all the tree gets covered in soot, the lighter one starts standing up, right? And so um, this is from um, um, England. Um, I won't go too much. It's a very classic experiment. A lot of people criticize it a little bit because it's from the 1800s and the standards that they use for statistics and stuff maybe don't meet today's publication standards, but it was a fairly good study, right? But been replicated in different areas, but it's a classic, classic study, right? Um, here's two from the textbook. And so what they're doing here is um, there's an introduced tree that got into Florida that's a relative to, closely related to, but different from the native tree that's in um, Florida, right, and our native species. And so um, these um, bugs, hemipterans, true bugs, this is a soapberry bug, uses its um, long proboscis, or beak if you were, but it's a proboscis, its nose, right, to tap into the sap inside the fruit. And so if you notice, the native um, tree, the native vines had a little bit larger fruit, right, and that the native vines are soap berries. That's why it's the soap berry bug, right? And a little bit thicker. And so they tended to have larger beaks. Proboscis. Now I'm saying it. <laughs> Proboscis. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then on the introduced golden rain tree that's come in, that's become more prevalent, um, ones that are surviving with the smaller beak have come over and um, populated um, the area. And so now you can see the actual beak length is much smaller. Take a minute to look at this diagram and think for a second. So here we're looking at the difference of going from 8.5 millimeters to 7 millimeters average, right, length of proboscis, right? So the whole bug is probably just a centimeter. And so if you're looking at that, I just wanted you to think, and if you haven't used the metric system or measured things, you know, with your fingers, you would, there's no way on earth you could actually see the difference between 8.5 
and seven millimeters on the bug out in the wild, right? So this is someone actually going out, collecting all these specimens, measuring the proboscis, that little part right there, to see how long it is to actually come up with this data. That's how minute and small um, microevolution can be, right? Uh, we'll come back later on when we get to the chapter, and actually you can actually see it from year to year sometimes in a population if you're really looking for it, all right? Again, right, thinking of evolution, it's the average trait in a population. We're looking at the beak length in the population, right? Not individuals, right? These individuals are dead. There are museum specimens. That's the old population. These individuals are alive now today, and they have a different size proboscis. Something has changed over that time. That's evolution, right? Here's another test, right? And so what they did here, I don't know if I can get me out of there. Screencast has very limited things you can do with it. Um, the program I'm using to record. And so here, what they're doing is they have three pools over in Africa. And they have killifish, right, and pike chicklids. And what they prey on are guppies, native fish, right? And in one pool, they have killifish that are eating other things, but there's no guppies in there. Either they've been all eaten and um, the predation has um, weeded them out, but they're no longer there, all right? And so the two different predators um, attack in different way. And so here, this is small fish, that's the guppy, that's the predator. That's the predator, that's the guppy. Here's a predator, no guppy, okay? And so what we're seeing is the killer fish eat small guppies. So the ones that survive grow very fast. So evolution is selected for a very fast growth rate to become larger when they're mature. And so if you look at the size of the guppies here compared to the two pools, they're larger in this pool. Where the chicklids are, right, um, they eat the large guppies, so they grow slower, right, and the ones that survive are the smaller ones, right? So with the killifish, you end up with larger guppies because of the, the response to the predation. With the pike chicklid, right, you end up with smaller guppies because of the predation. So here we have small guppies, all right, micro-evolving with the predator, the chicklid. Over here, we have no killer fish. So what they did is they took some of these small guppies that would be pre had been preyed upon by the chicklid, put them into the pool with the killer fish, all right? And the killer fish chooses um, to eat the smaller ones so the larger ones would survive. So you would make as a hypothesis, so, think you're, so don't look at the bottom of the screen there. Um, as a hypothesis, what do you think would happen, all right? So all of a sudden you're in a new predator and they're eating the smaller fish. And so you'd expect over time then that the ones that would survive are the ones that would grow a little bit faster and at the end they would be um, um, larger, right? And so you can see after a few generations, you can see the difference. So 161 to 185, 67 to 76, right? The age, right? So that's the, the a mass, right? That's their, their weight, the larger fish weigh more. Right, and then here would be the average um, age, so how quick, and so there's taking a longer time, so they're growing more, all right? And so when you want to compare the blue to the red, you can actually see that it did respond, right, um, as you might hypothesize um, following evolution and the selection pressure that you're subjecting it to, all right? So we have evolutionary experiments, lots and lots and lots. I can go on and on and on about microevolution. There's a tremendous amount of, evolu of evidence with microevolution in so many different ways, right? And in this one, I just want to point out, you could do the same thing and actually get to the genetics behind it like we did with the mouse population in Nebraska. Here's just looking at the morphology, but you can actually trace it down to the genetics. Another type of microevolution is something called artificial selection. And as it implies, it's not natural, right? And what makes it artificial is that it's humans selecting who survives and who doesn't rather than nature. And so you're getting crops that are being tended by, by humans. So this is an agriculture, both with animals and with plants, right? And even to a degree with um, formation of microbes and, and things like that. And so here um, we have over generations and we're, we're, um, and we're indebted to all of our um, farming ancestors over many, many, many thousands of years of de deriving the crops that we eat today. And so here, these are all coal crops. Right, and so we have cabbage, we have kale, Brussels sprouts, cauliflower, broccoli, 
broccolini, kohlrabi, all of these ones. And if you look at them, they're all the same species, Brassica nigra, right? Black mustard, black meaning the color of the seed, all right? Which grows in Northern Europe in cool areas. And around here, we grow all these crops as a cool, cool season, winter, fall, spring crops, all right? And what makes it nat artificial is that from this, and the one thing that makes this work is that um, this wild mustard, all parts of it are edible, even, even the leaves, mustard greens, you can throw another one in there, right? And so all parts are edible. And so what happens slowly over time is different farmers, by selecting little variations that they liked a little bit more and planting those seeds, and then they actually, once this little feature got a little bit more advanced, they actually started selecting ones even more and more that way for either the leaf or for um, uh, the axillary terminal bud, or the flowers, right, stalks, uh, or the swollen base. And so all of these are derived off of um, wild mustard, right? It's also microevolution. Now this one, they look significant enough because they've been selected for, as I mentioned, for thousands of years, right, that they do look very, very different, but they're not different enough when we get to talk about species yet to actually call them separate species. So we just call them different varieties. So they're still all wild mustard, right, of the ancestor root, but we actually name the varieties because you can actually recognize those traits, right? But you can cross among them, some of them and stuff. They're close enough related. Okay, another um, type of evidence, obviously is probably the one that first came to mind, maybe should have started with that, are fossils. Because fossils give you that big scope of evolution of, you know, everyone thinks of Tyrannosaurus rex, right, and dinosaurs. Right, and so that gives us the idea of where things came from and how they've changed over time to give us all those lineages, right? Key things about fossils, they give us physical evidence of past life, you can date them. We know how many millions of years ago they lived, right? They give us what they look like. And so if I go back to this, it's nice that we see Brussels sprouts and you have this arrow coming from mustard, but we don't know what all of the ancestral varieties looked like you know, in between mustard and Brussels sprouts. We just have the end product, right? And so in fossils, we can get lineages and know, and I'll show you the one in a minute for, um, you saw one earlier on elephants in the first lecture. This one, I'll show you one on whales and talk a little bit about whales and how that relates to the concept of marine mammals, right? They also can give us missing links. Those are the things that are gone in between. And so we now know that birds are descended from dinosaurs. They are basically the living lineage surviving of dinosaurs, right? And we have a famous missing link fossil I'll show you, right? Um, missing links is anything that's along the way. So as I mentioned before, you have today's species and you know what an ancestral species way back looked like. And it'd be nice to know anything along the way that links those two, but isn't around is the missing link, right? And we'll talk about that term is used a lot for human evolution. And we'll talk about um, how that's been filled in quite a bit. Um, when we get to vertebrates, we'll use that and show you that from fish to amphibians that used to be missing links is there's lots and lots on the big chart there, all right? Uh, we'll get to fossilization later on, but one thing to remember about fossils, it's a rare event and you have to have hard parts um, to get survived. So the fossil record doesn't have everything in it. Right, and so it's not an equal opportunity thing to get in the fossil record. So it's kind of rare, especially in human lineages, our, our evolution, um, because of, of how our species formed and where it did, didn't favor a lot of um, fossilizations, not a lot of fossils. Okay, and so this is today's living extant species. Extant means living, and that's an armadillo. When Darwin was in South America, he came across, and this was a, a museum, um, there's a younger me there in the museum, uh, exhibit on um, things Darwin collected and exposed and talked about. And this is a glyptodont. So this is a fossil related to, There's this is the diagram of a glyptodont, but it's related to an armadillo, right, from South America. And so fossils give us great evidence, right? And again, you can date fossils. This is a missing link. So if you look at it, what is it? Well, it looks like a bird, right? But it's not exactly a bird, right? So you can see that the bones have become quite small, right? So very lightweight. And you can see all the feathers, right? And it flew, right? And so it would look like a bird, but what makes it not a bird is if you look here, 
Still has a jaw and teeth. Birds don't have jaw and teeth. They're too heavy. Evolution has turned that into a beak of fingernail type stuff, keratin, right? Still has a tail, like all good vertebrates. But just like us, we've lost our tail. Birds don't have a tail. They may have feathers that stick out for flight, but those are feathers, not bones, right? So they just have a little stub of a reduced tail, kind of like we do, right? And then over here, you can still see that it still has fingers and claws and probably helped it to hold on to trees and grab and maybe even help it crawl up a tree a little bit to get a little lift for flight, right? Um, so anyway, this is Archaeopteryx, ancient bird, and um, a great example of a missing link. Okay, other things that give us evidence are homologous structures. And what a homologous structure means, homo means the same, right? And homologous structures are ones that somehow are the same, right? And, um, and they show common ancestry because it's the same feature. So here, all right, um, we can see the arms and the legs, right? These are the same conserved bones, radius, ulna, right? Um, and things that you might recognize as being in us, right? So all vertebrates have the same basic bone structure. So that'll be a homologous feature, right? And they have that because they're all coming from a common ancestor. And since then, they've specialized into different features. And so, uh, as I mentioned before, this doesn't have a, uh, a bird on it. This is just more closely related to us. These are all mammals, right? So they're just in the mammal clade. And so from the base of the mammals, spreading out to the different types of mammals we have, we have the same bones, they're color coded. Some are used for swimming, some for walking, some for grabbing, some for flight, right? Different structures, right? They're homologous because they come from a common ancestor, right? And you wanna remember the term that we use for evolution is descent with modification. It's much easier to tweak the shape of a bone than to make a whole new one. And we'll come and talk a little bit about that when we get the macroevolution in genes. And so it's easier to turn on and off the controls of how big a bone gets, right? That doesn't take much mutation to come about versus making a whole new bone in a new position, right? And so that's why we see this conservation, this homologous structure. It's showing you the, that conservation of a development, right? But specialization and changing. So we have these homologous structures, showing you the same ones, again, giving the names to the bones, and those are all the same bones. And we contrast that with analogous structures. So analogies, when you're comp comparing two things and making them say what they have kind of in common. So analogous structures always do the same thing, where homologous structures sometimes do and sometimes don't. But analogous structures are not derived from a common structure ancestor, right? So they're completely different, separate origins, right? But there's something about it that superficially looks alike, right? So here we have a bird flying with wings and a butterfly. We call them both the same things, wings, right? This one, as I showed you, those bones in the wings, right, are derived from other vertebrate bones and other reptiles, birds are reptiles, right? Butterflies aren't a vertebrate, they're not in our, clade whatsoever. They're not chordates. They don't have any bones whatsoever. So the structures aren't even closely at all structurally related to each other. So that would be analogous. They're doing the same thing, but they show no common ancestry. They give no hint to the evolution of where they came about by comparing those two. One type of homologous structure, sometimes over time, so homologous structures get modified, but sometimes they lose their purpose and then evolution slowly reduces them, all right? And so we call these vestigial structures. They're hang-ons from their ancestral um, structures. They're homologous to something that was functioning before, but no longer serve a purpose, all right? And so you, our tailbone here, right, the coccyx, doesn't serve any purpose for us whatsoever. But being a good mammal, right? We have a tail, right? That's one of the features of mammals. You have a nice long tail, right? Think of dogs and most of the other mammals, but a few of them have lost that, like us, right? And so vestigially, those genes are still there making the bones, but they just don't get very big, right? Um, in snakes, they've actually, so snakes are derived from lizards, right? And in the snake lineage, they've lost their limbs, right? And, but they're in the python lineages, not all snakes, but in the python lineages within the snakes, 
they still have a pelvic girdle and just remnants a little bit of uh, the legs. So they'll be vestigial. Right. Here's showing you whale evolution, which I want to talk about a bit more in a minute. And so we can see that the modern toothed whales, right, so ones with teeth in them, all right, um, have the remnants of the pelvic bone from when it had legs, right? And so their ancestry is on land. Whales are mammals, and these ancestor mammals were on land and probably were going in and out of the water. Think something like a polar bear, right? So they're spending a lot of time in the water, right? But they're on land, right? And they were derived from land. But then over time, they start specializing and they're spending more and more time on the water and less on land, and they adapt to being more in the water. And then they continue at this stage, there'd be something like a seal. Maybe these ones probably at this stage um, would still be able to come onto land, maybe to reproduce, right? Um, so they have some rudimentary appendages to help them onto land, right? But otherwise, they're not on land at all. And then we to get to the stage where you're the modern whales that never, ever come onto land, all right? But if you look at him, you can still see a little bit of that bone, similar to the python lineages of the snakes. And so here's showing you some of the ancestral ones. And then there you can actually see in the modern um, whale, right? You can actually see the pelvis and hind limb. Okay, and so if we look at this, we can actually see that the whales, you can see this evolution going along. But if we go back, right, they're actually related to the hippopotamus and ungulates like deer and elk. So that's the big clay. So they had some land-dwelling ancestor, right, along here that gave rise to um, all the lineages. And notice again how this chart works as the phylogenetic tree. The lines that go all the way across are still surviving, right? And then here we're really just following these fossils along the lineage of the whales, right? And so you can actually see how the older one is more land-based, a little bit more recent, more like a uh, uh, um, seal. Right, and then you're getting to primitive to modern whales. Right, and so this is a nice example when you compare whales to other organisms of convergence. And so convergence is looking at lineages that look similar but aren't closely related. Right, so it's kind of in a variation of analogous features. Right, and so if I were to compare a shark a tuna fish, an orca, and a seal, if you looked at them, they all superficially look alike. They're very streamlined, right? They don't have um, arms and legs. They have flippers, right, and fins, right, for propulsion in water, right? Um, you can go on and on. A lot of them usually have a darker backside and a lighter underside, right? Um, hunting fish, right? All these things, right? So you might think, well, that must mean somehow they're more closely related. But if you remember from the whale, it's related to, more closely related to a deer or hippopotamus. So that's more closely related to, first of all, a whale is a mammal. So it's more closely related to you or a kangaroo or the seal down here than it is to a shark or a fish, right? And sharks and fish are very separate lineages themselves, but they're much older before vertebrates came onto land. And so if you look at this, they look somewhat alike, right? And so um, what's happening is we call that when they're kind of merging to have the same morphology. Remember, morphology simply means shape, size, coloration, what you, what you see and recognize, right? They're converging. They're, they're looking the same, all right? And so that would be convergence, but they're not closely related. And the reason they're converging is because they're in a similar habitat. They're adapting to being in the ocean, right? Sharks are the base of the clay. They're always in the ocean, right? Tuna fish are always in the ocean. Over here, it's not. They started on land, and the first ones in the ocean looked more like land animals in the ocean, but over time, they ended up looking very similar because they have the features that survive better in the ocean over time, and evolution will select for those ones time and time again because it's the physical environment, and as those mutations slowly come up, they're going to kind of look similar, and that's the convergence. So if you look at our chart, there's your shark, a very separate lineage from the fish, but they're, they've always been in the ocean, right? So that's why they look alike. They never came onto land. They evolved in the ocean. They're there, all right? 
But if you look, we've gone on to amphibians and then reptiles and then mammals. And that's a nice ungulate down here. All right. And so that's the ancestor of the whale. Right. Why does it look more like a shark than it does a deer? And that's the convergence, right? Not because it's more closely related, right? Remember, that whale is more closely related to the deer than it is the shark. It's on this line down here. You'd have to go way back here and come back up this way to get to a shark. They're not closely related, right? They're all vertebrates, right? But within the vertebrates, they're not closely related, right? And so um, a nice example of that is also when we're going over the different types of um, evolution trends and the phylogenetic trees we talked to and I gave example of paraphyletic in lab and so when we look at marine mammals even that term right isn't proper clade or evolution because that's also convergence because I just went over the evolution of whales coming from a common ancestor with deer and ungulates right but seals have a common ancestor with bears and other carnivores so it's two separate lineages so again that's convergence even in the term marine mammals Right, they look alike because they adapted to being in the sea. And if you look at that term, you can even go farther out to look at the manatee, and then even another one that's not even on here to look at sea otters. All right, and so very separate lineages, right? But superficially, these all kind of look more like each other because they're adapted to being in the ocean. Then you think of the whore, of the walrus, you might think, well, it's more closely related to a manatee or a whale than a horse, but that's not the case, right? So that's convergence things that converge, right? Huge scale convergence is looking at, because of how the, mam the mammals have separate origins on separate continents, right? But similar ideas. So in North America, we have deserts, we have tr um, subtropical forests, we have tr forests, we have woodland, all this stuff, right? Similar habitats exist in Australia. So you're gonna have animals, in this case, mammals adapting to similar habitats in different parts of the world, right? And so they'll look superficially like, but they're not closely related, right? So the sugar glider versus the flying squirrel. A sugar glider is a marsupial. It's more closely related to a kangaroo, right? Flying squirrel is a squirrel and is more closely related to a horse or any other placental mammal, right? And so we have lots and lots of these animals in convergence. So Tasmanian wolf to the mar our wolf, flying squirrels, the marsupial version of a mouse, right? Again, the convergence. Here's a nice little chart that shows you um, the differences. And so superficially, you might think that the mole um, that we have might, because it looks similar to the mole in Australia, might be more closely related to each other, but they're not. Everything here in this blue column as a common ancestor are more closely related to each other than anything in the green column. And the same with the green column. They're all more closely related to each other than they are here. So that's all convergence because they're all adapting to somewhat similar habitats and by evolution coming up to something that superficially looks alike. If you start looking at them, the behaviors of the Tasmanian devil and the wolverine are somewhat different and they have different features and stuff, but superficially that might look very similar because there's something physically about the environment that's um, choosing those for evolution, right? And an example, because it also happens in plants, it happens in all sorts of organisms, right? Um, and then molecular comparisons, we can take any gene and actually run it across a lineage. And so DNA now lets us compare any living organism with any other living organism and show how closely related it is, right? You can now go and do your um, ancestry.com, um, take some your saliva and figure out where your ancestors more closely related, where they came from around the globe, right? And that would be an example of micro micro evolution, right? But anyway, so genes give us great um, ability to compare organisms. Here's looking at hemoglobin, which is a blood protein that carries um, oxygen on the red blood cells. And obviously humans are more closely related to humans, so they have about zero differences. But you're more closely related to a macaw, right? Which is a type of monkey than you are to a dog. But these are all more closely related to each other because they're mammals than to a bird, a reptile, to a frog, an amphibian, and all down here, land free, right? So you can see farther and farther back. And this is in our lineage, the vertebrates. But anyway, you can see that farther back you go, there are more and more genetic differences in just the sequence of this one blood protein molecule, right? You're looking at the one, one thing, hemoglobin. And so your hemoglobin and the hemoglobin of a lamprey are more different from each other than your hemoglobin from a monkey's hemoglobin. 
because of that ancestry. And that gives evidence, right, of evolution. Okay, lastly, we'll start, um, talk about embryology. And this works in um, vertebrates. So this is our lineage that have bones. And so it turns out that something that doesn't change very much is called highly conserved. And so here, your embryological development is highly conserved. Anything that goes wrong during embryology usually has catastrophic effects. And so evolution, right, highly conserves. Any mutation happening during embryology usually is lethal and gets cut out. So it doesn't accumulate very many mutations. And if you look very early on, you can see the gill slits, right? You can see the tail, right? And so these are key features of our clade, right? And so one of these, right, is us. One's a reptile and one's a bird, two reptiles and a bird, a bird and another reptile. And so if we look, there it is. There's a bird and, a, and another reptile they didn't claim it, and us, right? And you can see how highly conserved. And it actually turns out that and it's so highly conserved that the more closely related species are, the longer the embryo looks the same for an amount of time. Um, it's somewhat old now, but they did uh, one of the first in utero, um, so inside the, the uterus during development, they had a little camera and they could take pictures. And this was, I think, from the 1990s. And um, they were publishing this, this pregnancy going along. And in the, they used to have these paper magazines. You've heard about those. And they'd send it out in each issue and people were following it along. And it was to about seven months before people, and they didn't tell anyone, figured out they were look, actually looking at a chimpanzee and not a human, all right? And so again, the more closely related invertebrates, this doesn't work for plants, doesn't work for other things, right? But invertebrates, more closely related, the similar um, embryology you will have for a longer period of time. Okay, um, not evidence, but I want to talk um, a little bit about, since we're talking generally about evolution, about the rate of evolution. And so Darwin, when he came up, he was strongly influenced by geology, these slow, constant processes over time, right? And even in geology, that's not exactly true anymore. We see periods where things speed up and slow down. And so he had this idea that evolution is this very consistent, constant, slow pace going on. In many areas it is, but we now know because of the volatility of the earth, there are periods of time with great upheaval and we get these mass extinctions and lots of climate change, right? And then after that, there's a period of time where things change more rapidly. Because if you remember, when things are under stress, mutations build up. There's a slong, much stronger selection pressure pushing populations to the new conditions. And so it turns out there's a period of time where there's a lot of die-off and change, and then things stabilize. And so we see lots of things in the fossil record where you get punctuated equilibrium. So this is time going on. And both things exist in the fossil record. Punctuation, um, we'll talk about when we get the mass extinctions, right? But we do see it's a very significant factor, right? In, in certain lineages in particular, like our lineage is the vertebrates when we get to it. And so you're going along and then there's one period of upheaval right here. And so the populations will diverge, right? Specialize and then things calm down and then there remain very slow changes going on. Versus the idea that you just very slowly, continually, slightly building up things. But notice they go from orange in a relatively quick amount of time to yellow and red, and they remain yellow and red. So you have your punctuation where it changes, and then the equilibrium that comes out. In gradualism, you're going from orange to slightly a little bit redder and slightly yellower, slightly yellower to yellow, slightly redder, slightly redder to red. All right, continues. Both exist in the fossil record. Gradualism is much more common in the sea because um, it's uh, more resistant to climate change because they have all that water and that high heat capacity, all right? Um, but especially on land and more recent events with comets and things like that, um, we'll talk lots of examples of punctuated equilibrium. Okay, um, at this point, you should um, uh, be ready to uh, take on the next lecture will be um, talking about people who influenced Darwin. I'll try and keep that one short because I don't want to just bombard you with a bunch of names, but it's just an example of how science works and you build on what other people have done. And um, we have a quiz coming up after that for the end of uh, chapter 22. So you want to review all three of the lectures and prepare for the quiz. You'll be able to take it multiple times. I want it to be a steady guide more than, you know, um, a test but it will help you prepare um, for that, for this module.